My name is Jake, welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna do another Review My Pie video where I review subscriber portfolios. I absolutely love this series. It's a way for me to interact with all of you and it's interesting to see how different people all across the globe are investing in a similar type strategy. But first, if you're new to my channel, I created this YouTube channel about a year and a half ago and really the goal in mind was to help inspire and educate new or beginner investors to learn about dividend growth investing. That was really the whole goal. And I'm not one of those YouTubers that are very flashy. I, I'm very limited with my, my editing skills. Really, I try to focus on on what I'm saying and really make it relevant for the audience here. Here on the channel, I have three series that I focus on. I focus on dividend growth investing. That's all things around dividend investing. That's for all of you dividend nerds like myself. The second series is around Review My Pie. It's where I'm interacting with all of you. And this is gonna be the 14th video of this series. And then the last series is around financial independence and retiring early. For those of you that have been following the channel, you know that my wife and I were in our mid thirties and we're looking to retire in our early forties. And we're looking to do so by living off of our dividend growth portfolios, that which we share here on YouTube. If you follow other YouTubers in the finance space, I really get inspiration from a few other YouTubers that I really personally admire and, and you know, enjoy following. For example, if you follow PPC Ian, I'm a big fan of him when it comes to dividend investing. When it comes to financial independence and retiring early, I am a huge fan of Amon and Christina from Our Rich Journey. So if you're familiar with those other channels, I really get inspiration from them and in terms of you know the content that I'm creating and the topics that I'm talking about. So if you're a follower of those channels, you're gonna see a lot of similarities in my mindset, how I invest, the type of rationale that I have when investing into certain companies. And so when I review these pies, I really do it from a long-term investor's perspective, from a cash flow perspective. So if you're a fan of, of Ian or Amon and Christina, I know that you're gonna get a lot of value out of my channel as well. In today's Review My Pie, we're gonna review four subscriber portfolios. The first portfolio is gonna be from a 21 year old out of the United States, the second from an 18 year old out of the UK, the third portfolio is gonna be from a 30 year old from the United States, and then the fourth, a 22 year old from Australia. As always everybody, I do not pre-record or pre-script what I'm gonna say in these videos. I'm reviewing the portfolios for the very first time when I'm looking at them here while recording the video. And as always everybody, I'm not a professional financial advisor, so don't take what I'm saying as professional financial advice. This video is just merely for your entertainment. One of the things that I love about starting a new year in January is you're reflecting on the previous year and you're looking at your goals for the for the coming year. And a lot of times we're looking for that in, internal motivation, right? You might have just signed up for a new gym, right? You're saying, okay, I'm going to get back into shape or I'm going to fix parts of my life that are maybe not or sub a little bit suboptimal. And sometimes we just need a little bit of motivation to get ourselves going and get us moving in the right direction. So this is me doing my part in helping all of you to get motivated here in 2021. Well, now that we're all motivated, let's take a look at the very first pie here from Kenny. Kenny writes, hello, my name is Kenny. I'm 21 years old and I'm planning for dividend growth. I would like a higher dividend percentage, but I also need the companies to be reliable and stable. Any suggestions for any stocks in any sector? Also, some stocks might not fully be in the correct categories since I was moving a lot of placements around. Here's my portfolio. Okay, awesome. So that is a really, really good point. And a lot of companies here in 2020 were tested. You know, if a company suspended their dividend in 2020, it could mean a few things. It means that they were in a very cyclical business that was very dependent on consumer demand, right? With the pandemic here in 2020, a lot of businesses froze up with lockdowns in place. A lot of things were happening that were outside of the norm. Okay, every financial crisis or market correction is a little bit different in nature. They, there may be some similarities, but if you look over time, they're, they're usually a little bit different. And we haven't had a pandemic like this in 100 years where we've had such a dramatic impact on financial markets. When it comes to reliable, 
I really like looking at companies that have free cash flow, that have a low payout ratio. That's the key thing. When you look at reliable and stable, you want to look at companies that are not paying out so much in their dividend that it's it's not sustainable because they're paying more out to you know their shareholders and dividends that they have in free cash flow. And especially if you're 21 years old and you're looking to hold onto your portfolio for your lifetime, you want to make sure that you know the investments that you're you're having in your portfolio that they're sustainable, right? That they're not going to be you know increasing their dividend one year, decreasing in another, and it's like that back and forth. That's not something that you want as a dividend growth investor. So let's take a look at your portfolio. You're up seven. 78% over the last five years, not considering the reinvestment of dividends. You have 53 holdings. You have a 3.4% dividend yield. Now that obviously fluctuates, you know, as the market goes up and down and you have a very, very low expense ratio. Okay, so let's take a look and see how you have your portfolio set up. So it looks like you, the largest slices here that you have are in REITs, funds. I would assume this is your ETF fund. Uh, so 16% in ETFs, that's absolutely fine. Healthcare, 9%. Banking and financial, 9%. Consumer cyclical at 8%. Industrial, 7% tech at 6%. Okay, so you're 21 years old, you didn't specify in your email your time horizon. Your time horizon really dictates how you should have your, your percentages set up for, you know, for your particular situation. Assuming what I talk about on my channel is never selling your shares, right? It's a little bit different than the traditional fire movement where you're liquidating 4% of your portfolio every year. That's very different what I'm talking about than other channels like, for example, Amon and Christina from Arch Journey, they talk about the traditional fire movement. My, my approach is a little bit different. So if you're looking to retire in the next, you know, 10, maybe 15 years, I think having tech at 6%, you know, is fine. But if you have a 20 year time horizon, a 25, a 30 year time horizon, 6% is probably a little bit on the lower side. It could actually go up a little bit more. Growth you have at 6%, utilities 5%, communications 5 SPHD you got there at 3 and energy at 2%. Okay, let's take a look at your first slice here in REITs. So your REITs, this is actually a growth portfolio here in Real Estate Investment Trust. So I'm assuming you got a lot of hyper growth REITs in here. You probably got data centers or, or um, cell towers, something to that. Uh, something in that sense. Let's take a look and see what you got in here. You got, okay, you have a little bit of a mixture. This is actually surprising. Also with realty income at 32%, you're getting that performance. That's actually not bad at all. You got Main Street Capital, okay. These are two good monthly dividend payers. You got DLR and you got Crown Castle. Okay, this is th these are the growth ones that we're seeing here. And you got Innovative Industrial Properties. I think this is fine. I think um, if you want to expand into other areas, into REITs, I just made in my last video here on the channel, I talked extensively about real estate investment trusts, and I go into detail around the different sectors and how I have my portfolio set up. When it comes to this, you're getting a good dividend yield, right? You're getting a good dividend yield and you have great performance. I think this is this is fine. If you did want to expand into other sectors within REITs, you could also look at industrial REITs, for example. But this is this is really good. This is a high performing slice, really well diversified. I like it. Let's take a look at your next slice here with funds. You got VYM, you got VIG, VTI, SCHD, VOO, and SPHD. It looks like you got SPHD in there twice. Okay, so these ETFs, they act very, very differently. Okay, so with VYM, this is a higher current yielding dividend ETF. With VIG, VIG is really for somebody that has a 20 year plus time horizon. VIG really acts kind of like the S&P 500. You're, you're gonna get a below a 2% current dividend yield. It grows pretty much on par with the S&P 500. VIG is more so if you have a 20 plus year time horizon. VTI is also kind of in, the, in that same category. VTI, VIG, and VOO, they're kind of in the same bucket. There is overlap, but they're, they're, they're pretty different, right? They have a very different approach, right? You could say, okay, well, I could just get VOO or VTI and then I get exposure into all of them. Yeah, you could you could do that. They, they do look at different areas of the market and yeah, they're, because they're a broad-based you know, ETF, there is gonna be 
overlap, but I think it's it I think it's personally fine. I also like SCHD. I have these in my portfolio. I think these are all very very high quality ETFs. And quite frankly, you can't really go wrong with any of these. You're not going to sabotage your portfolio by having any of these in your in your portfolio. I think really what it comes down to is this side right here with the target allocation and that really depends on your time horizon. And so I've shared a video on that in the past in terms of investing based off of your time horizon, but this right here if you're 21 your time horizon, it could be 20 years, it could be 10 years, it could be 30 years. And my recommendation for you or anyone watching this video is understand what is your time horizon because that is gonna dictate how you should have the allocation set up. The earlier you're looking to retire, for example, within the next 10 years, you would wanna bump up SCHD, VYM, and SPHD. If you have a longer time horizon, for example, 20 plus years, then yeah, you bump up VIG, VTI, and VOO. I hope that that makes a little bit sense. If you want to get more in depth in that particular question of how do you invest by your, you know, based on your time horizon, I'd, I'd recommend checking out that other video that I made on the channel. Now let's take a look at your next slice here in healthcare. Healthcare, you got a really good healthy dividend. You got Johnson and Johnson, AbbVie, Pfizer, Merck. Yeah, um, Altria Group is a consumer staple. Uh, I think you did mention that with some of your your holdings in in separate slices. But yeah, with Johnson and Johnson, AbbVie, Pfizer, Merck, I think these are all really really great healthcare companies. Uh, you can look at a few like these are really more so around current income. So with a time horizon of 10, maybe 15 years, if you were, if you have a time horizon longer than 15 years, there's others that you could look at, for example, with Stryker, Medtronix, there's a few others out there that are really, really good. The next slice here with banking and financial, you got, you're up pretty significantly, 104%. Over 3% dividend yield. You got JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Bank of Nova Scotia, and Visa. Yeah, I mean, these are all really, really good, good companies. These are sleep well at night companies. If you wanted other growth companies, you could, you know, insurance or banking companies, you could look at Aflac, for example. Um, there, there's a lot of other great companies out there. For financials, I really like the sector specific financial ETF from Vanguard. That's one that I'm personally invested in. Um, I think with financials, there's a lot of speculation around what the Fed is going to do with rates. Are they going to keep the rates low? Are they, going to, are they going to increase them? It's really, you know, it really comes down to how well the bank or the financial institution is managed. For example, it's hard to find a bank out there that is so well managed like JP Morgan. Really, really good bank. The next slice here in consumer defensive, you got Home Depot, you got Costco, you got Procter & Gamble, you got Eastman Chemical, okay, you got Clorox and you got Coca-Cola. Yeah, these are these are all really good companies. These are well-established companies. You have a little bit of a different mix. You got some retailers in there. You got some consumer brands in Procter & Gamble, Kimberly, Cl uh, not Kimberly Clark, I was thinking about Kimberly Clark, uh, Clorox, Coca-Cola. Um, there's others out there that I personally really like. I like Walmart, I like PepsiCo. There's so many great ones out there, but the ones that you have in here I, I think you can go to bed at night every night and not lose a second of sleep with these companies. Let's take a look at your cyclicals. You got Walgreens, you got McDonald's, Lowe's Waste Management, Texas Instruments, Nike, Starbucks. Some of these are a little bit, um, yeah, you, you mentioned your email with, you know, categorizing them in the right slices. The companies themselves are all really, really good companies. But also, like I mentioned before, these companies act fundamentally different. These are so different. If you look at a Walgreens, for example, and you compare that with a Nike, these are night and day. This is what I mean with your time horizon. If you look to never sell your holdings, you're going to need 30, 40 years to reap the benefit of the cash flow from Nike than you would with investing in a Walgreens over the same time period right? Walgreens is yielding a much, has a much higher starting yield than a Nike, but Nike is growing so much faster. So that's why it's so important. One of the most important things when you're investing in a dividend growth strategy is know your time horizon, know your numbers, understand the different types of companies, how they're growing, what is their current yield, at what rate are they growing their yield. That is the most important thing when you're investing in a dividend growth strategy and you're looking to live off of your dividend growth portfolio. 
So, so important. The next slice here is in industrials. You got Caterpillar 3M, Lockheed Martin, Lagan and Platt. These are great companies, Caterpillar 3M, right? Especially with, with the current presidency and what, what's going on now, you can see the market likes it. The market likes Caterpillar. We're gonna get it, you know, we're likely gonna get an infrastructure bill that's gonna prop up you know, Caterpillar, that's going to prop up 3M. With Lockheed Martin, that's a little bit different, right? For the next four years, you might see Lockheed Martin under pressure. I am long Lockheed Martin. I think it's a great company. The fact that Lockheed Martin is selling off now with the election result, I see it as a buying opportunity. Because I invest forever, I buy these companies with the intention to never sell them. I see this as an opportunity to increase my yield on cost. Yeah, Lockheed Martin is going down, Caterpillar is maybe going up, or 3M or other, other companies. I see this as a buying opportunity, okay? And that's where we talked about, you know, stable and reliable. You, you mentioned that in your email. Making sure that these companies, when they're going down, their yield on cost is going up, understand the payout ratio. Is the payout ratio still healthy or is the company going to have to cut their dividend? Really, really important. Okay, let's take a look at your next slice here in tech. What do you got here in tech? You got Broadcom, Cisco, and IBM. These are, these are great current income oriented uh, technology companies. You know, telecom technology with Cisco, Broadcom, IBM, really high yielders. Now, the question that I, I stated earlier, are you looking to retire now in the next 10 to five years, you know, five to 10 years, 15 years, or 20 to 30 years? That is a question that everyone watching this video has to understand. If you have a longer time horizon, you know, maybe look at other, other companies like an Apple or a Microsoft. But if your time horizon is here within the next 10 to 15 years, these are great. Absolutely great. Let's see what you got in growth. <laughs> Speaking of Apple and Microsoft, I promise I did not look at these slices before. I promise. Um, Apple, Microsoft, uh, the uh, QQQ, NVIDIA, Disney, these are all great. So these are your growth, as you can see, up 555%. Holy shnikes. Like, unbelievable. I think these are great. And the fact that you have it only at a, what, I think it was like 5% of the overall portfolio. Um, I think this is, this is a good approach if you have a shorter time horizon. Uh, let's see, uh, 6%. 5% in utilities. You got Southern Company, Nexter Energy, and Duke. These are all three really, really great utilities. Really great utilities. When you talk about stable and reliable, these are three stable and reliable companies. Duke, Nexter Energy. These are going to do so great. And the thing that I love about these utilities is they're going to do great regardless of who sits in, in Washington. Regardless of the political party that's in, in power, these companies, in my opinion, they're going to continue to do well regardless. Now, some, some might, you know, be a little bit more favorable under, under a blue, you know, administration and maybe some a little bit more under a red. But I think as they stand here, I think they're, I think these are really great high quality utilities. Let's take a look and see what you got in communication. You got Verizon and AT&T, they're, they're absolutely fine. I personally invest into both of them. I think they, they're both great. You got SPHD in here and you got Energy. Energy, you got Chevron and ExxonMobil. I think these are both fine. Um, I like that you only have it at 2%. For me personally, I actually sold out of Energy entirely. It only made, when I was investing in it as well, I only had 2%. The reason why I sold out of energy is I was getting exposure to energy through my ETFs anyways, right? Some of my high yielding ETFs already had exposure to Chevron and ExxonMobil. And for me, it was like, okay, well, I never want to sell these. My time horizon is forever. Yeah, these, you know, Chevron and ExxonMobil, they're, they're evolving. They're, 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 you know, they're adapting to what's coming, right? As we get away from fossil fuels, et cetera. I, I just personally, for me, it was like, okay, it made such a small percentage of my portfolio anyways. I said, okay, you know what? Scrap it. I'm just going to get exposure to energy through my ETFs. And that's what I've done. But if you do want to hold it in your portfolio, I think limiting it to about two or 3% is spot on. I think that's a good choice.
Kenny, thank you so much again for sending over your portfolio. I think you know what you're doing. I really like that you only have 53 holdings in here. You have a good, healthy dividend of around 3.5%. You have really good market performance. Once again, it really comes down to that question of time horizon. And once again, you mentioned reliable and stable. The way that you get reliable and stable cash flow for your dividend portfolio is you're focusing on companies that are continually growing. They're growing and they're rewarding you as a shareholder with a growing dividend. All right, let's take a look at the next portfolio. And the next portfolio is from Jared. Jared writes, my name is Jared. I'm 18 years old and just moved to the United Kingdom. I don't have much funds. So I add very little each week, roughly 10 pounds. This is my dividend pie. I have three other pies. I have a Feng plus pie, ETF pie and renewable energy pie. I add mostly to this pie second, mostly to ETFs and third to the Feng plus, then lastly to renewable energy. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work. I love your videos. I think it is so cool that an 18 year old from the United Kingdom is following the channel. Man, I wish that I was as smart as you when I was 18, learning about investing and really educating myself and working on my financial literacy at such, a, such an early age. You know, just absolutely incredible. All right, let's take a look at your portfolio here in Trading 212. For everybody that is outside of the United States, Trading 212 is comparable to M1 in that you can build pies. I think they have automatic investing and I believe their trades are free or commission free. So for everybody that's outside of the United States, this is something to take a look at. I personally have never used it. I've interacted with a lot of you on the channel. A lot of you have good things to say about Trading 212, but I can't personally recommend it from personal experience because I've never used it. Used it. And the link that you sent me, I think is a referral link because get a free share of 212. You have been invited. So it looks like Jared invited us here to 212. Um, I'm going to leave a link in the description below to this portfolio. It looks like it is an affiliate link. Um, so just be aware of that. So if you're outside of the US, hell, you, maybe you can get a free stock. I, I don't know. This is this is not for me though. This is, this is from Jared. Uh, let's take a look and see here. So Jared, you're you're 18 years old. You didn't mention your time horizon. So once again, I'm, I'm kind of harping on this a lot in this video is your time horizon really dictates how you invest and, and the type of holdings that you should, should be invested in, especially when it comes to your allocation. But for this purpose, I'm going to assume, you know, because you didn't say it in your email, I'm going to make an assumption that your time horizon is at least 20 years, right? You're 18 years old. I think 20 years is a good time horizon. And let's take a look at it from that perspective. So you got 9% into Realty Income, you got Johnson & Johnson, you got Coca-Cola, you got McDonald's, Avi, LTC, Stag, Good. You got a lot of exposure to REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. So you're 18 years old. I, I don't know how the tax laws work in the United Kingdom, but here in the US, real estate investment trusts are taxed differently than you know normal, like other companies, from a qualified dividend from like Johnson and Johnson and Coca-Cola. So that is something that I would recommend you do some research and understand. Maybe somebody can leave a comment below how the tax laws work when it comes to qualified and non-qualified for the UK. Um, I know in the US it's not as favorable. Uh, you got so you got a few REITs in here. You got LTC, Stag, Good, monthly dividend payers, Realty Income, but they're taxed a little bit different, at least here in the US. You got 3M, you got Pepsi, you got Verizon. Procter & Gamble, JP Morgan, Starbucks, Pfizer, IBM, and Wells Fargo. Okay, so you're 18 years old, and man, and you're investing like probably like your grandpa, like investing into Johnson & Johnson and Coca-Cola and, and McDonald's. Like these are all really, really great companies. Where is Microsoft? Where is Apple, right? Where, where, is, where are these growth companies? Like you got a few, you got Starbucks. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is if, you know, if you're looking to retire in the next 10 years, this portfolio is amazing. Absolutely amazing. But if your time horizon is longer than 10 years, I would encourage you to reevaluate how you have the allocation set up because simply from a tax taxation standpoint, um, over the next 20 years, this is not as optimal as it could be from a tax perspective. Okay, so some, something to take a look at. Uh, for example, for 20 years, I really like JP Morgan. I like Procter & Gamble. I like Starbucks, Pepsi, really, really great. So um, that's, that's really the feedback that I would give you there is understand your time horizon. And I would encourage you to, to maybe, after you've understood the, the tax laws in, in your country, then 
it might be worth looking at reallocating some of these holdings that are going to fit your time horizon a little bit better. But as it stands, as it stands for these companies, I think these are great companies, right? When it comes to, to the monthly payers, Realty Income, I own in my portfolio, LTC, I own in my portfolio, Stag, I own in my portfolio, Good, I own in my portfolio, Thank you again, Jared, for sending over your portfolio. I think these are great companies. It really comes down to your time horizon, the tax laws in your country. I would recommend taking a look at those things. Thank you again for sending over your portfolio. All right, the third portfolio here is from James. James writes, hey Jake, I really like the reviews that you've been doing. I noticed we are about the same age, so I would really like your perspective on this. I'm 30, I plan on contributing about 2,000 to 2,500 a month, currently have about 10,000 in my portfolio. I plan on growing my portfolio until retirement, except in about six years, I also plan to withdraw about 25% of my portfolio to down pay on a house with my spouse. If you can review if I'm on the right trajectory with my allocations, the way they are, or any additional advice. Appreciate everything. Thanks, James. Well, first off, James, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. It sounds like we are kind of in the similar in a similar situation where my wife and I we're looking to retire off our dividend growth portfolio, and also we're looking to you know in the next seven eight years you know we might relocate from Austin, we might buy a house somewhere else. So our investing strategies are pretty similar. So a few initial thoughts: what I would recommend taking a look at. Instead of selling off of your portfolio, why not create a separate portfolio specifically for your house? Why not create a house fund or a house account where you're investing for your portfolio? That's one of the things that I love about M1 Finance is you can have multiple accounts in M1 Finance. It doesn't have to be with M1, it could be with Robinhood, it could be with Fidelity, whatever. Maybe what you could do is instead of investing 2,500 a month in your you know, your cash flow portfolio, maybe you dial that back a little bit and invest a, a small percentage in a growth fund in a separate account. And then with the goal of selling out of that account, once you're looking to buy your house or whatever it may be. That's something actually that I've also considered myself is, you know, with M1 Finance, you can have multiple accounts, right? You can have your, your main portfolio, you can have a sub portfolio. When my wife and I, when we have our, our baby boy here this year, we're gonna create another account where we're gonna have a, a baby fund or whatever it may be, where we're saving $50 a month for, for our kid. And also my wife and I are looking to do that as well, where we're, we're gonna be saving aggressively for a house here in the next seven, eight years. And so we would have an additional account there. I would encourage you to look at them separately. And I would not look at selling off of your main portfolio to buy your house, but have a separate account with that specific goal. As always, that's, that's just my opinion. When it comes to the numbers, now this is really important. When it comes to the numbers, you have to understand that your numbers have to work in your advantage. You have to construct your portfolio so that it meets your goals. And it's always easier when you work backwards. Once you know your goal, then you can optimize your portfolio so that, they, so that it meets your goals. In my last video, I shared a dividend reinvestment calculator that I put together. And in that video, I shared exactly how you can construct your portfolio so that it meets your goals based off of your time horizon. For example, the, the reinvestment calculator, I, I have it up here right now. You said that you have an initial investment of $10,000. You're investing around $2,500 a month. That's about $30,000 annually. Let's say your portfolio yields around 3.5%. You have a dividend growth of around 8% and a capital appreciation of around 7%. What you can do is you can project, okay, if you continue down this path, of investing 30,000 a year in your portfolio, how much cash flow are you gonna have in what time frame? And so if you look over here and you see, okay, well in 10 years, if I go down this path, I'm gonna have just around $20,000 in annual cash flow from the portfolio. But if you fast forward 20 years into the future of doing this, investing with this approach, you're gonna have over $80,000 in annual cash flow. This is the power of compound interest. So I'll leave a link to this dividend reinvestment calculator in the description below so that you can play around with it. But I would highly recommend playing around with this calculator and see, okay, what do I need to invest? What are the type of investments 
right? And the type of investments are over here. You can update the numbers. All that you have to update are the fields in yellow, and then it will automatically update the, the table here and the graph. And what you can do is you can play around with the numbers and see, okay, well, maybe if I got a side gig and I made an extra $500 a month, what would that look like, right? How much more could we invest into our portfolio and how, can, how will that impact our time horizon? So let's take a look at your portfolio. You're up 111% over the last five years. You have 40 holdings, 3.5% dividend yield, and a very small expense ratio. These are some really good metrics, by the way. 111% with a 3.5% dividend yield? Hell yeah, that is actually really, really good. And with only 40 holdings. You got 14% in technology, real estate, finance. You got some index funds in here, it looks like. Consumer, healthcare, utility, telecom. Bonds, okay, oil and gas, okay. In my opinion, there's really only two reasons why you would have bonds in your portfolio. The first is when the market corrects, you're planning on selling out of your bonds and then buying your, your holdings, your other holdings in your portfolio that have been sold off. That, that's fine, you could do that. The other reason is the emotional, you know, the emotional benefit that comes with investing into bonds because there's lower volatility. If those two reasons are not the reasons of why you have bonds in your portfolio, I would highly encourage you to reevaluate why you're holding bonds into this portfolio. Let's take a look at the first slice here in technology. You got Tesla, you got Qualcomm, you got Broadcom, Amazon, Cisco, Facebook, Microsoft, and Apple. So this comes back to what you were saying with selling out some of your portfolio to fund the uh, the purchase of a home. And as I mentioned, I would highly encourage you to separate them, to have them separate, not have everything into one account. I, I would personally separate them. But as it stands, these are these are great companies, Amazon, Amazon Tesla, you know, Facebook, they're, they're not going anywhere any anytime soon, as far as I can tell. When it comes to real estate, you got Realty Income, you got DLR, and you got Crown Castle. These, these are great. These are all in three different categories. I would encourage you to look at maybe if you're considering and growing out your portfolio, you know, maybe if you transition some of your growth stocks out and then maybe you have, you know, a few holdings that you want to add, you could take a look at the industrial REITs that I like in Prologis. You could also look at, you know, uh, self-storage. I really like public storage, for example. Now let's take a look at your finance slice. You got Main Street Capital, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and American Express. Yeah, these are these are great companies. I think I think these are fine. Let's take a look at your next slice here in your indexes. You got SEHD, SPHD, VYM, and VO. Oh, these are absolutely fine. I like SEHD, I like VYM, I like VOO, and I like SPHD. SPHD is the the holdings in there. I personally am a bigger fan of SEHD and VYM, but I can understand you know, because it pays a monthly dividend, you know, that is really attractive, but I personally like SEHD and VYM. Let's take a look and see what you got in consumers. You got Philip Morris, you got Coca-Cola, you got Starbucks, you got McDonald's, and you got Colgate. I think these companies are really great. When I look at them, when I see Philip Morris and when I see Starbucks, I think they're fundamentally different. And when I interact with a lot of the people that are following the channel, a lot of people message me and say, hey, I like your investing strategy, but I don't agree with you investing into sin stocks. A lot of people now are a lot more aware and self-aware of what they hold in their portfolio and the companies that they hold in their portfolio really represent them. You know, a lot of people, they invest based off of their ESG goals, you know, environmentally, socially, and, you know, corporate governments. They're, they're really, their investing habits and the holdings that they have in their portfolio are really led by their personal beliefs. And, you know, if a company is socially responsible, this is a lot different than what we've seen in previous years. A lot of times people were just chasing yield. They didn't care what the company did. Nowadays, a lot of companies are very self-aware of the fact that a lot of investors are specifically investing based off of that principle that a company is socially responsible. And I love that M1 Finance allows you to, to really create a portfolio that, that enables you to follow that passion, right? If, if you want to invest socially responsible or invest into companies that are socially responsible, M1 Finance gives you that opportunity. A lot of ETFs even out there are centering around a strategy where they have 
only socially responsible companies in their in their ETF. So I think it is so cool. I think when finance gives you a really a great opportunity to invest in a socially responsible way, whether you want to invest into sin stocks or if you want to invest into companies like Starbucks that are a little bit more you know self aware. All right, let's take a look at your next slice here in healthcare. You got five holdings. You got Abvi, Merck, Johnson and Johnson, Gilead, and Pfizer. I think these are great companies. They're great healthcare companies. They're more focused on current income. Let's take a look at your next slice here in utilities. You got Southern Company, you got Dominion and Nextera Energy. I think these are great. You could say, okay, well, with Dominion Energy, uh, they just recently cut their dividend. Um, I, I personally hold Dominion Energy. It makes a little bit of a smaller position in my portfolio. I also like Duke Energy. But uh, these are these are three great companies. Let's take a look at your telecom. In telecom, you got AT and T and Verizon. Great. With bonds, you got a corporate bond. Okay, it's good. And you got a BND, the total bond market ETF from Vanguard. Yeah, that's fine. Oil and gas, you got Exxon Mobil and you got Chevron. Okay. Industrials, you got Lockheed Martin and you got Waste Management. These are all. These are both really really great. All right. Let's take a look at your last slice here. You got industrials. You got Lockheed Martin and you got Waste Management. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, James, for sending over your portfolio. As I mentioned, a few things that I would summarize here is I would separate your goals. My wife and I have a very similar goal as you where we wanna live off our dividend growth portfolio, but also on the side, we're still saving and investing for a home. So separating those accounts can help you a lot. And lastly, I would recommend checking out the dividend reinvestment calculator, play around with the numbers, see what makes sense, see if the current holdings in your portfolio and the rate at which they're growing is going to help you meet your goal based off of your time horizon. Thank you again for sending over your portfolio. All right, let's take a look at the last portfolio here is from Kiran. Kiran writes, hi Jake, thanks for the investing videos. YouTubers like you make it so much easier for me to continue my monthly contributions and keep the investing research, especially when no one around me invests. I think that is so important. It's so important surrounding yourself with positive influences, whether it be here on the internet or you know in your personal lives. I think this is this is so important. So you continue right here, I am 22 years old, living in Victoria, Australia, doing software engineering, and since Australia does not have any good investing apps like M1 Finance, I cannot make you the pie, but instead I will send you screenshots from my current Excel spreadsheet and other photo of what stocks my monthly contributions normally go into. In Australia, we have what's called a super fund that your employer has to contribute 9.5% of your wages into, and normally the investing is done through super fund companies. Rarely self-managed so I will not include this as it is not available to touch until 65 and are usually just treated like an S&P 500 index okay yeah it's kind of like a 401k here in the US I currently add 2200 Australian dollars around 1600 US every month which is roughly 50% of my wages after tax. And my goal is when I'm between 30 to 40, I can transition to a more dividend portfolio, removing most of the growth stocks and be able to live sufficiently off of that or work part-time until I'm 65 and get access to my super, which will then increase my monthly income significantly. My investing strategy is mainly to invest in ETFs, but I sometimes will choose individual stocks. I like at a time and I feel need more individual focus than having some covered in an ETF like Facebook. All is in US dollars. My current holdings and the buys coming, I currently realize I need more growth ETFs, so starting the purchases into them now. Well, first off, this is so great. A few things that stand out are you have a plan, you're investing every single month, and the fact that you're investing 50% of your income is huge. If you follow the FIRE movement, financial independence from retire early, we talk a lot about your savings rate. Increasing your savings rate is one of the keys to retiring earlier. And 50% is a great way. Man, I wish, you know, when I was 22 years old, I wasn't following the fire movement. I wasn't really investing as heavily, right? I would, you know, invest a little bit here and there, but I didn't have concrete goals like you. This is amazing. The next thing that stands out is you have a, your time horizon is between the age of 30 and 40. This is a spread of around 10 years. This is a pretty big spread. What I would encourage you to do is start focusing on, okay, do I want to retire at 30, 35, 40, and really drilling down into, okay, what do I need to do? What does it look like if I retire at 30? And what would it look like if I retire at 40 and really getting concrete with your goals? That's something that I would encourage everyone
everyone watching this video, if you're looking to retire off of your dividend portfolio, really drill down into your goals and really set as specific goals as possible. The dividend reinvestment calculator that I shared with everybody, that's really to help you to set that goal. If you know that it's not realistic to retire by the time you're 30, then okay, that's fine. Then set your goal for 40. In terms of selling out of growth and then you know repositioning into, into dividend growth stocks, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, for me personally, I, I invest with the intention to never sell, but if you did want to invest into growth stocks and then transition into dividend stocks, I think that could work absolutely fine. All right, so let's take a look at your portfolio. You got a few ETFs in here. You got SCHD, you got VYM, you got VIG, you got VOO, you got VNQ. SPYG, you got ARC, some ARC funds in there. Okay, really, really cool. Um, you even got Bitcoin and some cryptocurrency down there at the bottom. Um, what I'm looking for is your allocation. What's what's the weighting? So I see here over market value, and I think you mentioned with targets and your current. So this is what you currently have, but not necessarily what your target is. All right, so at a, at a glance, you have some high quality companies in here, and they all serve a little bit of a different purpose, right? You got Johnson & Johnson, you got Store, you got VYM, and then you got Facebook, and you got Google, and you got Slack in there, for example. So you got some growth stocks in there as well. I think, um, I think your goal of transitioning out of growth into dividend stocks can work fine. Um, I really like the focus on ETFs especially if you wanna take this approach over the next five, 10, 15 years, I think it's easier to pick a winning ETF than it is to pick a winning company. And that's, that's my opinion. And so the fact that you're going after growth ETFs as well, I personally like that a little bit better, especially like, you know, we talked about earlier in one of the other portfolios that we reviewed that somebody wanted to invest for in, you know, in growth to buy a house. With my wife and I, we're, we're looking to do something similar. What we would do is we would invest into high quality growth ETFs and not necessarily into individual companies. And that's just my, my personal opinion. Um, I, for those of you that follow the channel, I'm a little bit conservative in my investing. And for me, I would sleep better at night with, with that approach over individual companies. So, so let's take a look. So what kind of ETFs in here you got? You got SPYG, you got VOO, you got VIG, you got ARC, you got some ARC funds. Okay, so for the goal of transitioning from growth to dividend stocks, I really like this. I really like SPYG. I really, really like it. I also like the technology ETF from Vanguard VGT. I also like the... Uh, uh, QQQ that tracks the NASDAQ. I think these are also really great dividend growth ETFs. VOO, you can't really go wrong with VOO. VOO is good. VIG, I, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily see VIG as a growth ETF to buy low and then sell high. I, I just personally, that's just not something that comes to mind. When it comes to the ARC funds, I actually, I'm a big fan of, of Kathy Wood. I, I really like the ARC ETFs. I think uh, the I, I really like a, um, you know, ARK, ARKK, their, their main ETF. I also like the genomics ones with ARKG. I, I really like that. Um, I think they're great. I think they're good ETFs. I think uh, they're really good growth ETFs. So what do you got here? So it looks like this is your, your target weighting versus your current weighting and you have it broken down by dividend ETFs. I'm assuming these are the ones you're not going to sell, and your growth ETFs, these are the ones you're planning on selling in the future to then transition to dividend stocks. So your dividend ETFs, SEHD, VYM, VOO, and VIG are great. REITs, VNQ is good. Uh, store and O, you know, Realty Income are not ETFs, but they're, they're good REITs. Growth ETFs, SPYG, and you have the three ARC fund. I really like SPYG. I, I like I like ARC. I think th those are fine. I also like the Vanguard Technology ETF ticker symbol VGT, and I also like QQQ. Those those are my my favorite growth ETFs. But that's just really honestly just my opinion. Now, when looking at the weighting, I think 60/40 is fine. I think uh, you know that might adjust and change as you you get older and your priorities shift. 
Thank you again for sending over your portfolio. What I'm looking for is I love to see that you have a plan and you're executing on that plan. I think this is great. This may change over time as your priorities shift, but as it stands now, really focusing on your goal and going after it, increasing your, you know, focusing on what you can control, right? You can control your savings rate for the most part. Increasing and controlling what you can control is so, so important. And then making the numbers work in your favor, I think this is absolutely great. Thank you again so much for sending over your portfolio. Thank you again, everybody, for watching the video, following the channel. If you would like me to review your portfolio in a future video, shoot me over an email in the description below. Make sure that you're adding you know, your age, your goals, what you're investing every single month, what you're trying to do, and I will do my best to review your portfolio in a future video. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you're new to the channel, I would invite you to subscribe. If you like today's video, give me a thumbs up, and I'll catch everybody in the next video. You know what? I think we're gonna be friends. Can everyone say hi to my friend? That's crazy. I just wanted to say thanks. I'm glad you came along, partner. <laughs>